Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our Cape Center October uh, meeting. Tonight, we are very privileged to have a very well-known speaker um, among us. We've got uh, Oka Slotegraaf with us. And the topic for tonight's meeting is two centuries of major discoveries and inventions at the SAIO. So I have asked Oka before we start this meeting just to uh, tell us a little bit more about himself. You know, I think uh, some of us want to know about the uh, great golden year of the uh, Marmozette and all the, the uh, backstories to it. But uh, Oka, we uh, hand over to you. What I'm going to do at the moment is make you a co-host and I'm going to put spotlight on you. And then we are ready to start the meeting. There we go. Over to you, Oko. Okay. Thank you, uh, Marius. Uh, um, I'm totally unfamiliar with Zoom. Is, is the, can you see my display quite clearly? Yes, we can. Excellent. So I suppose I'm so, I should start by saying, Good night, everyone. That would probably be my preference at this moment because about 20 minutes ago I had a power failure. So that always is a way to make your life extremely interesting when you're trying to salvage your slides. Um, I would like, if possible, to sort of turn tonight somewhat into a sort of a discussion or a QA and a if that's possible. I don't know if Zoom will allow that, if we can, if we can manage that. Because um, just for the record, this topic was, was selected by, by Ketchel and Marius, and um, they, they chose a very difficult topic, and they also assume that I know what I'm, that I know what I'm talking about. Now, that's a very wild assumption to make because I don't. What I've generally got is a list of, I've got a list of facts, but you know, so was Wikipedia. And what I've most, mostly got is a list of questions and puzzles. And some of these puzzles will 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 hopefully um, get a chance to take a look at them. Um, so I'm going to talk about discoveries, but I'm entirely really the wrong person to do that. By the way, let me interrupt myself. I was recently taken to task by some person on social media who says that you're not supposed to have these bright backgrounds because that is overstimulating. And, you know, the snowflakes prefer a sort of darker background. So I, I've been especially prepared this slide for them so that they can pause the YouTube here and then um, maybe just listen, listen um, further. There's, <clears throat> this topic is way too, too complex and I certainly don't know enough. Ian Glass is the best one to, um, to give an introduction. But you get the same Afrikaans, the script is only me. And that is sort of literally the case in this instance, because those of you who've recently been to the observatory may have noticed these two large, vast sheets of, of metal have been um, you know, bended to the wall to celebrate the 200 years and the fact that the observatory site in Cape Town is now a heritage site. And quite conveniently, and quite honestly, this is going to be the shortest talk I've ever given, because there we have it. That's what's written on the plaque. And I suppose that would be, would be, would be quite sufficient. So um, I can leave you, I can leave this running for, for the next, say, 15 minutes, and then you've probably got um, a more cogent summary than, uh, than I can come up with. These are really sort of the very salient points, and I think they're actually interesting if one, if one, looks at them a little bit and tries to sort of remember what, what astronomy was like many years ago. I was speaking to Ian this, this, off this morning and I said to him, you know, I've got no idea what would motivate somebody, somebody as good looking and handsome as say Thomas McClear to become an astronomer in the 1800s. Because, I mean, he knows in his job description, he knows that he's not going to be plumbing the cosmological depths and discovering black holes and colliding white dwarves and so on. He knows that he's going to be sitting 
literally day in and day out, measuring the positions of stars, sort of like some celestial accountant. And I don't quite know what the, what the glamour value of that is. So I think the motivation of why people became astronomers and why they made all these amazing discoveries, perhaps back then, is, is somewhat different to, to what it is now. If anybody has any thoughts on why you'd want to become an astronomer in 1830 or run about that, you know, well, please, please share, share them with me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now besides this list, I thought that there's perhaps another way to, to look at things that were done at the observatory and to frame it in terms of comets. So now, normally, comets aren't considered to be super interesting by, by real astronomers. You know, real astronomers want to, want to do cosmology and they want to do all these exploding things, and comets are kind of boring, I suppose, to some. So I prepared this graph that shows all the comets that were discovered um, from South Africa since we've had recorded history. And it's quite interesting that, that in one sense, the observatory's, um, the observatory's um, history is in a sense bracketed by comets. Because if you look from about Le Kyle's time, 1750 and on, there's no comets discovered. And then there's a blip in 1830. And that's a comet that was discovered by Mary Ann Fellows. So Fellows wasn't a, um, an astronomer, but she was an, she was an expert thing. She was an astronomer's wife, her husband, Fearon Fellows. He was the first Groot Kokodur at the observatory when it was established. And um, uh, again, Ian can, can tell you all the juicy details, but Turns out they, they not only didn't have toilets, but they didn't even have a building. And then they also didn't really have the systems. And in those days when you had to sort of be four people or have four arms or, or six legs or something to operate the devices they used. And Fearon uh, had to uh, ask his wife to operate one of the machines just so that he could get the initial set of observations done. And while she was doing, she, while she was helping him, or they were together doing these laborious tasks, she discovered a comet. It was in 1830, the comet was in octaves. And I don't know if it made the local newspaper, but it got included in Fellows' big report that he wrote back to the brass um, when, he, when he retired shortly after that. So the first, let's say, professional comet discovered in the country um, was by Mary and Fellows in Cape Town from, from the site of the observatory. And then if we fast forward to the most recent comet discovery, there are two in the last quarter century. Um, the, the last one was by Nicholas Erasmus, an, an astronomer at SAO, who used one of the Russian telescopes, MASTER is the project name. Um, and um, he bagged the comet. It's a whole different story why there's a spike in comet discoveries from 1925 to 1950. That's a different um, and interesting discussion. And then I've just marked sort of in the middle of year, 1880s, um, William Finley's observation of a comet because we'll see that had one of that had a very big effect on the work that was done um, um, at the observatory. So to get back to the comet theme, comets really were baked into the founding principles of the Royal Observatory. These six points, one of them was added later on, these six points are the to-do to list that the, um, the Astronomer Royal's boss was, was gave him and said, look, if you want to go and be this fancy astronomer down in Cape Town, these are the things you must do. And fourth on that list, is that he must go and hunt down this comet that, that, was, um, that was missing. So back then, comets weren't incidental. They were, they were written into the founding documents um, of the Royal Observatory. 
this is one of my more um, kind of things I really wish that I could figure out. Um, what you're seeing is a, is a black and white photograph, which I guess is maybe from the 50s, I'm not sure. Maybe Ian can, can comment in the, in the, in the chat. Um, it shows a view looking towards the main building. I don't know if my mouth pointer is visible but you've got the main building lurking there amongst the pine trees. And in the foreground are these two pillars. You can clearly see they, they're made of brick and they've got some kind of cladding around them. And these two pillars were the first structures that were built on the Cape Town site. And they were built by fellows or, or one of these Handlangers with the purpose to provide a solid foundation on which he could put these, these instruments with which to make his measurements. So maybe one day with a GPS and some luck, we can find out exactly where those pillars are. I would love to, um, you know, to dig them up and see what remains of the first physical structure um, on site. Okay, now I must warn you, at round about now, is when the power went out. So if the slides from now on, if they are in a jumble or contain pornography, then it's not my fault, it's because of ESCOM. In those days, um, they didn't have, have, have tablets and, 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 and computer doors and things. So the astronomers would record their observations in little notebooks. Um, the notebook is about as big as your hand, and it flips up and you can, you can look very official like a cop. You can look very official and you can take out a pencil which is included in the notebook and you can write a note. And then we found a lot of these notes, of, of these notebooks in, in about 2015. We found a whole lot of them basically on the brink of falling into the river at, on the observatory site. And there's a whole bunch of them. And just to sort of give you as a calibration, there are 3.5 16 glass worths of, um, of these little notebooks. And they go back to the early times of the, um, of the observatory. And as I said, this was what folk would, how they would record things. So here's a page, a very atypical page. Most of these pages contain numbers in apparently random order in some kind of code. So you can imagine if you're an observer, you're doing technical numbery things, you're working at night, you haven't invented the LED yet. So you've got to write careful notes, but you can't write a whole paragraph because you can't see because it's dark and you need to maintain your dark adaption. So the notes they would make in these books are, are, are somewhat abbreviated, uh, but this is one of, the, one of the exceptional pages. It's written by William Finley and you can see there it's dated 1882, November the 23rd, and includes a nice drawing. There's several of these, of these drawings. Um, that's just a close-up of the previous one. And what Finley is describing here in, in quite uh, a big detail, because it, it, it comes up many times in these notebooks, is an extremely bright comet that he saw. He was observing one, one morning, he was observing an occultation of a star by the moon, and he shut up the dome and he went home. And as on the way home, he looked up and he saw a bright comet. And that comet turned out to be a daylight comet. It could be seen, you know, it could be seen well. Oh dear. Okay. So this is where the <laughs> this is where my slides broke. So I'm going to have to flip to thumbnail view and then look at my slides. And then that's my whole talk, by the way. Um, I think they might just be in order from now on, although maybe not. The comet that Finley saw, as I said, was extremely bright and it prompted several photographers, including what would later become president of the, of the Photographic Society, to attempt to photograph the comet with their 1882 cutting edge, really horrible cameras. And this is one of the photos, it's the only surviving one that we know of that, that was taken of the comet. It was posted to the observatory, and I see somebody has in very neatly and usefully 
can punch two huge holes in the, in the photograph to make it easy for filing, I suppose. But at that time, uh, um, yes, and, and at that time, the chaplain who was running observatory was a, a brilliant uh, man called David Gill. And Gill realized that if a photographer with a small camera could photograph this comet, maybe he could find himself a, photog a local photographer and they could work together and, and try to photograph the comet as well. But Gil had one, Gil had one sort of trick up his sleeve. He had this telescope. This is the six inch. And for those of you who, well, I, I assume most of you know, know the observatory grounds, that in the bottom left corner, um, that's the runoff roof observatory where this six inches is, is in today. But it wasn't always um, in this building. This telescope used to stand on a really tall pedestal, or quite exaggerated pedestal, like a compensation pedestal perhaps, in a structure known as the wind tower. Now, you'll be excused for not knowing where this building is because it was knocked down, I think, sometime in the 60s. But if we look at a site map of the observatory, um, Number 14 in the middle of this display, that's where the wind tower stood. So on the right of your screen, number one, that's the main building. And number two, that's the beautiful McLean dome with that beautiful refractor inside. And number seven here, that's that six inch that I just showed you in the runoff roof. So if you, if you, when you go to the observatory next and you're about to drive out, if you stop, Sort of run about there in the road, and you look to your right, you should still see a sort of a strange depression in the ground where the grass hasn't quite recovered from, from um, the bricks and the, and the foundation that was laid on. So that's one of the interesting ground traces that one can see at, 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 the, at the observatory site, is we can see where um, the wind tower stood. Now, of course, I mean, there are, there are photographs um, of the of the wind tower showing where they are. So um, what, what made this um, comet and telescope so super interesting is that Gill realized that he could photograph stars by attaching a camera to a telescope. So he got himself a local Cape Townian astronomer, uh, um, photographer. They piggybacked his box camera onto the six inch, and Gill would then, what we now today would say guide, Gill would then look through the eyepiece of the, of the refractor and keep a star kind of in the center of the field of view while making a long exposure. And those long exposure photographs, this is one of them, there are several still in existence. This is one of them beautifully showed the stars. Uh, of the comet, sorry. But Gill was more interested in all these little dots that he could see on the photograph. Because back in those days, if you wanted to measure a star's position, and if you think back to that, to that early slide I showed, the, the, the Cape Observatory was a substantial contributor to the science of astrometry. And astrometry is simply measuring the positions of stars. And that's this dull, laborious task that I was talking about, that, that that's what an astronomer would do in those days. But to do that, you'd need, initially, you needed two separate devices. You'd have one rule to device that would only measure the right ascension of a star. And then you'd have another big building with another even bigger thing, and that would measure the declination of the star. And you must now, oh, which little dim star did we see? And it says, now this one's Aura or that one's Dec, and that's no, and it's all very, very complicated. But suffice to say that before photography, the only way to measure the star's position was to make multiple separate observations um, and then collate the whole lot. And Gill realized that all he needs to do is take a ruler and he can just measure the position of the stars on a photograph. So the whole, the whole project of, of celestial cartography 
as he writes here, this is Gill's own words, it was by means of a photographic camera attached to this instrument that the pictures of the Great Comet were taken, which led, led to Gill's proposal of the photographic method of star charting. So this is interesting. Up to this time, 1882, 1883, nascent photography had not been applied as a technique to do astrophotography. And Gill was the one who then kicked off a huge project resulting in, as that plot tells us incorrectly, um, the first sky chart. So we'll, we'll, if there's time, we'll get back to that first sky chart um, comment. But the bottom line is um, Gill had a special telescope manufacture that's many of the manufacturers they were shipped worldwide and these were used to systematically chart the sky before this huge project Gil had done his own smaller um, version of a southern uh, of a southern um, survey now maybe at this stage i must interrupt myself and say the little caveat with why that isn't exactly the first photographic sky survey um, yeah, we see a gentleman looking for something. I like to think that it was that Ed who lost his keys, but not, not so much. Actually, what's happening is um, several years ago, we went looking on the observatory site for what remains of what is known as the Franklin Adams Observatory. Um, so John Franklin Adams was, uh, I think he was Scottish or something. I mean, I don't hold it against him, but I think he was Scottish. And he was a banker with a B and he was extremely rich. And then when, when, he, when he got his good life crisis in the 50s, um, he was sort of casting about what to do and they hadn't invented Porsches and things yet. So then he decided to go full time into astronomy and he spent vast amounts of money and he had for the time the best lenses made. And then he decided to embark on a project to just photograph the night sky because that's what you do when you're Scottish and 50 and fantastically rich. And the result of that was the Franklin Adams charts. Um, the FAC, as I sometimes call them. And um, Ian can, can tell you that when, when, when he started working at, at the observatory in the 70s, so sorry, I interrupt myself again. Franklin Adams is 1900. It's just, it's that, that sort of era. Um, so Ian would point out that when, when you were an astronomer in the 70s, working in the South, and you needed to get a finder chart to figure out what star you want to go and look at or what galaxy you want to plumb the depths of or so on. You use the Franklin Adams charts. Those were, that was the working astronomer's base chart. And um, those charts were photographed, half of them were photographed from here um, in Cape Town. Um, the other fraction in Joburg. And then of course the Northern hemisphere, the Northern part was, was done um, in, uh, back in Franklin Adams' home um, somewhere in England. Now, I don't know what I've done with that first slide now, but one of the points on the slide was um, me me geodesy measuring the shape of the southern hemisphere and measuring sort of the, how, how, how far and how big the planet is. Um, and I'm sure you all know Lakai did that and then it was redone several times because there were all sorts of questions and, and refinements to be made. And one of the people that was involved in, in this project is a chap called Charles Piazzi Smyre, a very precocious chap. Um, I think he was 16 years old when he came down, when he was shipped off to the Cape, he was probably 17 by the time he got here, and he was made the, the, uh, the astronomer royal's assistant. And um, Smyre had, had an eye and a hand for drawing, and this is one of the sketches he made when they went on this extended series of surveys to try to figure out what has happened with Lacalle's measurements and to try to perfect them. Why would the button click? Okay, I give up. Technology is not my friend today. Anyway, so um, this is one of CP Smythe's drawings of the, the, the camp that they set up um, on top of a mountain somewhere so that they could triangulate the countryside. So they would have a reference point, look at it, measure the angle, pack up, go all the way there, 
look back and measure other angles. And it, it was completely crazy. I, I don't know why they didn't just do this. But so this shows that, that Smythe was not only a good observer, by the way, but um, generally very really brilliant. Smythe was so precocious that he brought with him a newfangled invention called the camera. And then he took this famous photograph, which I'm sure most of you have seen. So again, there's a photography theme running here as well. Um, and that's the oldest photograph of an observatory anywhere, as far as one can tell. And that is obviously the Cape Observatory. And then Daniel at, at SAO redid the shot. For those of you who know the, the main building well, you'll see that there's some shenanigans going on here because that signpost is on the left of the main building as you enter. But in order to match up the Piazzi Smile photograph, they had to, to Photoshop it a little bit. So photography too has its, um, has its roots here, up here in the Cape. So before I zoom to the last, to the most recent um, um, comet discovery, I'd just like to share with you a, a photograph that we recently found, or a, a painting that recently came to light. Uh, this was drawn by some military chap who fancied himself a gentleman and he would make etchings and sketches and things. And if you look on the right hand side, you see that strange shaped building. I'll just zoom in. So that's the wind tower where we had the, the comet discovery from. So this is long before the McLean. And this strange gossamer building, this sort of ghost like building within a building. This is the, the rather enigmatic magnetic observatory that was erected on the Cape Town site. If we go back to the map, see number 13 here, this dashed outline number 13 near the bottom of the screen. That's the area where the magnetic observatory stood. So in those days, this was far away from any other building. Because in those days, the 30s, the main building, number one, was the only structure on site. I think there were small ancillary buildings, but you know, they don't count. So they built this, the magnetic observatory, far away from, from anything else as far as they could. The whole building was made only of wood. There were no nails used. I think they probably used super glue or something because they wanted to make observations of the Earth's magnetic field. And if you had any ferrous metals in the nails and things, that would mess up the, the observation. But I just thought I'd share that, that um, uh, recent find with you. This was a, a poor painting that went up on auction recently. Um, how these things happen, I don't know. I mean, not auctions, how these strange discoveries just come into light is quite surprising. So then if we fast forward to the latest comet discovery that shows the master telescope in the bottom right, and then the discovery photograph of the comet. And um, We've got Nicolas, Nicolas Erasmus's involvement with the with claiming the um, the discovery. At this point, I want to share. This is uh, all I've got for the moment. Quite frankly, we we could talk about a great many other things. I think a very well, a unknown fact or, or an unappreciated fact is the role that Ian Glass played in the observatory's history, in the modern history of the observatory. He's not that old, I mean, in the modern observatory. And that is that he brought infrared technology to, to South Africa. And so that means how do you image, or he solved the problem of how do you measure or image or detect infrared radiation heat from things way out there in space when you're sitting on a planet that is hot and you've got telescopes that are that are warm and you've generally got heat to deal with. And, and there, are, there are other problems too. And the reason why infrared is interesting and important is if, um, if you've got an object out there that is, it's a star and, and it's going crazy, but it is surrounded by a dust cloud, then when you look at it with your normal telescope, you can't see it. So you'd look at that and send up to no stars there, that's boring, let's look elsewhere. But infrared 
is, is, a, is a wavelength that you can detect because the energy from the star will heat up that gas cloud. The gas cloud will then give off infrared light. So the sky in infrared gives you a different view of the ongoing energy processes. If you confine your, your observing to the visual, you know, the red to, to what's the other one, the red to blue, well, then that's nice. You get this nice little friendly color, LGBTQI friendly band, but you're not investigating the rest of the spectrum. And one of the most accessible alternative, or one of the most accessible regions of the spectrum beyond the visible is infrared. So um, people like Ian Glass, um, Alan Cousins, uh, and many others did a great deal of work to open up that part of the spectrum. And, by, and what I mean by this literally is you have to solve two problems. You have to do the mechanics, first of all. You have to build a detector. That means you must know what gallium is and what arsenide is and how to solder and all those things that, that I've got no idea of. So you need to be able to build a detector. But once you've got that, you must then also now cleverly decide how you're going to use this in a way that your results are comparable or transferable to others. So if you think about the problem of measuring the star's brightness, that's, that's tricky because my telescope is slightly different to your telescope. You're at a different altitude. You're looking at a different time of the year. Or the moon is doing something. So photometry measuring stellar brightness is a real challenge. And, um, Alan Cousins was one of the one of the people, one of the key folk on the planet, that helped set out a standard way of measuring a star's brightness in a way that I can explain to you the method. You can then build your own kit, and your measurements work the same as my measurements. It's exactly as profound as deciding that a centimeter ruler is going to have these measurements. Now, all of a sudden, we can all intercompare our results. So, um, Cousins did a huge amount for the visible part of the spectrum. Um, Ian came along with these new fangled infrared stuff and showed people how to do that. And the two of them later on extended the, the, the visible part of photometry to include the, um, the near infrared as well. So, I think if, if that's the only take home message um, that you that you take is, yeah, I think you know, we should give Ian a, a, a bit more <laughs> round, of, round of applause. And I'm going to close with a question or another question. Um, so one of the weird things we found in our archive is this image. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little um, print. Um, that's sort of a slightly larger view. And, and clearly it shows Table Mountain in the harbor. These things look to me, for all the world, like sailing ships. I don't know if you agree or disagree. They really do look like sailing ships. So I'm wondering if, any, if anyone knows when there were sailing ships in, in, in Cape Town and um, when this image could, could possibly have been taken. Yeah, it's... I just don't know anything about ships. One of the many things I don't know anything about is ships. I don't know when this could have been. So in the archive, um, Ian, myself, and others have been working to, to, to preserve the, the, the heritage of the observatory's archives. And we've come across all sorts of really interesting things. This is a small, um, this is a small, well, this is just a, an odd non-astronomical example. And at some point, I'm going to ask Marius in the future to, to give me a moment to, to talk to the, to your center to the Cape Center again because one of the things we're working on is, this, is is a citizen science project where we'd like to invite Cape Center members because you guys are clever plus you know something about astronomy to digitally go through the archive because the images will be digitally available and to Galaxy Zoo style help us to tag the image collection so Image recognition and, and Google and Facebook can do a lot, but they don't know anything about astronomy. 
but the members of the Cape Centre, they know everything about astronomy that we possibly want in, in this case. So, Marius, at some stage, I'm going to ask you for, for permission to um, talk about that. And that, as they say, that is it. Um, I'll be happy to, to, to take questions. I'll be happy to discuss things like discovery, for example. Why is that so important? Why is it important who was first? That to me is a strange thing, you know, does, does, when you discover something, is that because you were lucky? Is it because you were, you were doing hard work? Or is it more important that you discover a black hole or that you measure 100,000 stellar positions? There's something strange for me in the human psychology that we have this, this tension to talk about discovery as being a big thing. Um, and also discovering in modern terms, if we look at the history of the Royal Observatory, there were a handful of people. There were five astronomers, and I don't know, three slaves and two dishwashers. And something. So it's quite easy to track the outputs. It's quite easy to see, okay, but he did this and then he published that, and this is his diary and he was doing this, and this is his research output, and now we know what they were doing. But now fast forward to 2020. It's not so easy anymore to make a list of all the cool things that, that have been discovered at the observatory in the last 20 years or in the last 50 years. There are several reasons. The one is that there's simply more astronomers. There are more people on the planet and there are more astronomers. And that leads to multi-author collaborations. Because now, if you think about a network, if you're three astronomers, you can only have so many connections. If you've got 10 astronomers, all of a sudden your number of connections and therefore your possible collaborations just blossom. So as, as you get more astronomers, more institutions, more collaborations, it's less obvious what did, who made what discovery. And as I say, I, I, I sometimes doubt the idea of why discovery is so important. Um, you know, and, and wife being first is important. But that is it from me. Thank you for listening. Marius, over to you. Thank you so much, Oka. We really enjoyed your talk and I'm sure that there is a whole lot of questions that, 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 that people have got lined up. Um, if I might just start off, um, I remember that a couple of weeks ago, you started off with a forum where you were inviting people to actually join and cry and uh, solve some of these uh, old photos that, 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 that you guys have, have found in the um, archives. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, the mute were. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, both to, of the mute and of that forum. So um, that forum is a teeny tiny way to start this whole process of, of getting some collaboration going, getting a sense of who would possibly be interested. And within five minutes of putting up the forum, um, Jonathan Ballard guessed right. I think Jonathan is watching. Jonathan actually gave the answer to the first thing because there was one puzzling dome that we couldn't, well, that I couldn't identify. And so through careful Googling and, and contacting the Psychic Beyond, Jonathan gave the, the, the identification of the dome. But there are several other photographs that um, we have no idea what they are. They are non-astronomical at this stage. There is some Buddha war, I think, or some or people in LARPing, maybe, I don't know. There are people with guns and things and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that forum is there to show these are weird photos we've got. We don't know what they are. Can you help us caption them? Um, there's one set of Cape Town taken from, I think, somewhere on Mines Head or something, Signal Hill maybe. And I'm sure somebody out there knows enough about the minute of Cape Town's history to be able to give us a date for that. But the main idea will be to move into um, actually tagging the photographs. Because one of the things you would like to do one day is to make um, a 3D model that you can walk through in time and see what was happening on the site, because one could then do that at any other observatory or any other 
uh, inst installing for that matter. Does that answer the question, Marcus? Absolutely, it does. Um, yes, I, okay, so I've had the um, privilege of, of working with you on some of these, these, these items that you have found. I know that you and uh, some, uh, like for instance, Ed and Ian that, and um, Lynette that are sitting in this meeting here uh, are very in, involved with, the, with, with archiving a lot of these items. So what is the future with these items that, that you would typically find? I mean, there, yes, there's that wonderful painting that, uh, that, you, that you just showed us. You know, ultimately, you know, who, you know, where is that painting at the moment? Is it in private possession? And what's happening to a lot of the stuff that's at the, ob at the, ob at the observatory? Um, you know, who is going to ultimately take care of it? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So um, the painting was, <laughs> um, I've been the painting and lost the bed because Daniel had bought it. So <laughs> Daniel, Daniel had, had also heard about the bid and we were, just, we were just missing each other. So fortunately he bought it and Theresa went to pick it up. So the painting is now really where it should be. It's in the observatory. Um, so of course, in terms of intellectual property right, all this material, both the physical and the, 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 the IP belongs to the observatory. No, so it's it's not for us to to it's not for us as the center to do anything with the, with the, with the material because it does belong to um, to the observatory. Of course, I mean it is so that the observatory is a government institution and the government works for the people. So there's that there's that thing, but um, the idea is that all we want to achieve now is just to stabilize what is there. It, it's essentially emergency archiving. And like I said, those, 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 in, those. Okay, you're on mute. Like I said, it's a matter of emergency, it's emergency archiving. Those booklets I showed you, they could at any moment be taken away if there was a big wind, uh, a big rainstorm at the Cape. They were, were dumped in non-ideal circumstances, to put it mildly. So all we want to do is just stabilize the stuff. Because if, if, if Ian hadn't gone around back in the day and collected things, there wouldn't be an astronomy museum now. If you get a chance to go to McLean and you look at that astronomy museum, just realize that it wasn't little pixies and fairies and, and, and a centaur on heat or something that brought the stuff there. That was Ian that brought the stuff there, Ian and Vili, and I think, I think David Evans was involved as well, or was it Robin Catchwell at that stage as well? So um, they too were sort of technically, I suppose, acting outside of their ambit by doing this because they're supposed to be astronomers and not you know, run museums. But sometimes one has just got to say, there's no genoeg, and with, I don't care what the law says, this stuff is getting lost. So one has to do something to prevent that. But it does belong to the observatory, obviously, where it should be. Excellent. I see that we've got a question from uh, Christian. Christian. Hi, Not hello. So, so now I'm on my scene. Oh, Christian Hitler, right. No, okay. But Christian Koning, you is <laughs> Okay, right. So Christian, you're up. <laughs> I'm up again. Um, not so much a question, but um, I might elaborate a little bit on the comet detection uh, of Nick Erasmus, if you don't mind. Please, please do. Um, so I actually, one, I mean, as you might know, Nick Erasmus is working on asteroids. And one thing he does is he is checking images taken by the Atlas telescope in Hawaii, which is looking for asteroids. And obviously, they use an algorithm for finding asteroids, but the threshold is very low because they don't want to miss any asteroid. So, um, and so some human being actually has to check uh, the so the supposed asteroids. And so in September this year, 
uh, Nick was taking such an asteroid or potential asteroid and saw yes, it was an asteroid, but he also noticed it was a little bit fuzzy, so he had a coma. And so he actually double checked with other uh, team members of Atlas and they confirmed it was fuzzy. And so Nick reported a potential comet detection to the minor planetary center. And then a few days later, it was confirmed. So and that uh, comet was found by, well, it was found by uh, Nick on an Atlas image. And I think the master telescope found one in 2015, as you said. Well, thank you so much for that bit of info, Christian. So Christian, so this isn't, is this, this is not the comet in other words? Uh, that, that is a comet found in 2015, but not the one found by uh, Nick. Oh, thank you. See, ask questions, you learn something every day. Thanks, Christian. Thank you. Right. Um, Chris. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I um, just wanted to uh, ask about the um, painting, but um, you asked the question before me. But all I want to say, Alka, thank you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I love the talk and uh, very interesting things. I just want to reiterate Ian Glass. If it's not for people like Ian, David Evan, Catchpole, etc., uh, a lot of our heritage would simply be gone. The museum would not exist and a lot of things uh, would, would have simply disappeared. So uh, absolutely uh, uh, wonderful work. And um, another thing I just want to reiterate on, it's easy to track, as Alka said, decades ago what people did or centuries ago at the observatory. But um, these days, uh, actually, since the Royal Observatory became the SAO, uh, 68, 74, somewhere around there. Uh, the rate of scientific progress and discoveries has just uh, advanced so much that um, you just can't keep track of it. I found that firsthand with my website and uh, that I'm trying to um, uh, keep track of who did what and it's easy with McClare and those guys, but uh, these days it's, uh, you just can't keep up with it. Thanks, that's what I've got to say. Thanks, Chris, I agree. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, looking back to our audience, does anyone else have any other questions for Oka? You're welcome to just unmute yourself and ask the question. You don't necessarily need to put up your hand. Ah, Ian just said it was Peter Knox Shaw who saw the picture on auction. Ah, great. At this point, we should actually give the mic over to Ian because he can he can fix all the mistakes I made and he can tell us something which I which I left out because he's got the sensitivity for for the menu table. Well, Ian, you're welcome to uh, to uh, jump in and uh, uh, you know supplement the Oko's talk a bit. Anything yourself. I think what you said was mostly correct, so <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Just that the, those two little pillars uh, that you showed in one of the pictures, the background of that doesn't show what we call the new building. So uh, I think that means it has to be before about 1928 or 29, something like that. I don't remember the exact date when it was built. Yeah, good. Ian makes a good point. So if you, if you see these little picket fence running along here, behind the picket fence today stands uh, the sort of admin block, mm. which still is called the new building, even though it's, how old is it now? Well, about 1928 or 30, somewhere around there. Yeah, so it's 80 years old, but it's, it's the new building. Um, and, <laughs> and this is the, the entrance to the, uh, that white structure in the background is the main building. At one stage, they had something which we, which we, of course, don't see at the main building at the moment. 
they have sort of little cubicles or I don't know what you would call them, little dams. No, you know, you know where like like the little hut that your that your car guard stands in or a porta toilet or something. Mm -hmm. They have little porta toilet things, sort of appendices to the door, so that you would sort of come in and make Wendy you know, House. Yes, so imagine a, a vertical Wendy House. They had these little porticos or whatever they are um, at the entrances. I don't know if you know, there was you would come in and take your shoes off. I don't know if they were Buddhist or what the story was. Because that, that dark shape there seems to be a doorway in the corner of the main building. I mean, if you look at the main building today, where's that Piazzi Smythe image? Um, there we go. So that sort of dark shape is a door that must have been here somewhere near where that downpipe is. I'm not exactly sure what is on that on that um, um, photo, but I think it's well worth investigating. Ian, do you know anything about uh, um, Mary Ann Fellows? How, how, did, how did she how did she find the comet? I couldn't find anything. No, I've seen a reference to it somewhere, but I'm sorry, I don't remember where I saw it. I think it's probably again a case of this is a, a, a comet discovered by a woman, so let's not <laughs> let's note it and then just move along rapidly. <laughs> what year was that again that she discovered the comet? It was May of 1830. She found the comet in Octons. Right. In the meantime, I see Kitchell's also got her hand up. So while the <laughs> males are processing that, that bit of info. <laughs> You've asked for travel. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Ketchel. <laughs> so, what did the start of Arthur Cork said that, uh, you know, what, what might have possessed the, the astronomers and the scientists, if they were, a lot of them, they were generalists, if people were in those days, what, what for most possessed them to take up astronomy when, you know, it, it was not very glamorous? And, and then I think proceeded to, to answer the question, which is that they were breaking a lot of new ground and what they were doing was, was you know, they did a lot of first. Um, but, uh, you know, it's new discovery. But, but also, you know, if you look, if you compare the way that what astronomers did on a day to day and night to night basis with, with what astronomers do now, I mean, then it may not have seemed very glamorous, but they, they were dealing with their instruments, they were dealing with data. You know, they, they had a lot of variety in what they were doing. Modern astronomers are data scientists and they sit in front of computer screens, pretty much the same as insurance salespeople, um, you know, even hairdressers when they're making bookings or sit in front of a computer screen. I mean, really, what's the difference? Um, and at least I think there was a lot more, a lot more differentiation in, uh, in what people were doing then. I mean, I work, as you know, I work with a lot of astronomers and particularly the radio astronomers haven't a clue what's actually really up there. They have no connection with the night sky. They are, they are, they really are truly are data scientists. And um, it's, I think there's a it's such a huge difference between what the astronomers were doing in the early days of the, of the Royal Observatory and what they do now. It's quite, it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, and so I'm glad you, you started off with that question. I mean, think back to think back to astronomers 500 years before Herschel. I would imagine that part of their motivation is that they had some sense of of cosmogony and connected to some alternate reality. They were dealing with the divine. They were dealing with the transcendent. So that would make it. <clears throat> that's a cool thing, you know. I want to be an astronomer priest. I want to pretend I can predict the rising of the Nile. You know, whatever it was, I'm trying to pretend. So that connection, I can understand why a thousand years ago, I'd be an astronomer. And of course, now today, it's obvious why you want to be an astronomer. But this is bookkeeping. I don't know, it's, it's, it's just my problem. Well, I'm going to give the same question. I was saying, just sitting in front of me. Whereas in, in those days, you know, they, they, they were doing something a little bit more romantic and varied. 
look at the difference between the, 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 the royal astronomer and the astronomer royal, you know, back in the, uh, William Herschel. He, he was doing astronomy for the love of it. He was discovering little faint fuzzy things and double stars and stuff. But the official job of the astronomer was to be a branch of the military to provide better maps so that you can, with precision, murder all your opponents or steal their things. That was, astronomy was, you know, was positional and it was a naval thing. Um, so I understand William's motivation. But anyway, sorry, Marius, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oka. Uh, I, just a quick question. I was looking at this photo that you've got in the background and I, you know, I got a bit of insight as to some of the, the conditions that, that you guys found some of these uh, books in. But I was particularly intrigued because I looked at that one photo and I thought, is that a car door in the background? <laughs> yes. That's a, that's a Corolla hatchback 1972 door. So is this an actual photo of where you guys found the books in the, in the old garage on the... <laughs> This is after they were cleaned up. I, if you're interested, I can show you some photos of how we found it initially. Yeah, it was, do. It was quite grotty. So, yeah, um, please share it with us. Really? Yeah, I think we've got some, we got some um, time still, so that's fine. Okay, I can do a dance routine, which would be more entertaining. But then, just give me a second to just quickly get them. I can't think where they are. There we go. You put me on the spot, Marcus. <laughs> I'm glad to see the archives working. <laughs> ah. Is this not Marcus getting me back for what I did to him yeah. <laughs> a few weekends ago? You guys notice that pink dinosaur in the background in my in my picture. That's revenge for that. Whilst we're waiting for Alka, Ian, it's very nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a very long time. What are you up to these days? Oh, and, and there's Hetty. Oh, there's Hetty there too. Hello, Hetty. <laughs> Okay, so the building was called the Riverside Hut. What is called the Riverside Hut? Um, oh, I can tell you a story. Oh, this was sort of found there lying in a cupboard under a youth socket. It, this is the Franklin Adams telescope. The one I told you about, it, it's sideways because this was in the Northern Hemisphere. This is at his home in, in the UK. So this was the, the structure that he built. He built the telescope and the observatory there, took photos and then packed everything up in the shoebox, came all the way down to Cape Town and, re, and redid this. Um, so it's, and, and this photo was just lying there amongst a bunch of stuff. So after some cleanup, this is what the one um, collection of things looked like. Um, you know, the floor was wet and there was mildew everywhere and we didn't at that stage we didn't have N95 masks but I suppose we should have it was pretty dangerous um, I, I'm not going to be able to find the photograph now but um, this is just a life lesson which, which you can use it don't use it but you can thank me later so in the one building we ran a, um, a device that measures um, humidity and temperature. Uh, it's a data logger. It's a custom unit, a data logger that, that measures all these things. And we left it running in the archives for, for a long time just to get a sense of what the real temperatures were in the building. Because paper, you know, it, it breaks down over time and, and inks go all squiffy and, and you know, things go into, into what will jam to the moon. So you just need certain conditions. But you need to know data is good. So we had a logger running and we left it in the drawer and so on. And then one day when I got there, I saw that somebody had taken, had moved it. 
So then it turned out that there were students doing some um, um, uh, job shadowing work or something. And the one kid's cell phone had died. And then he, for some reason, happened to open this drawer, one of 17 drawers, found the logger, unplugged it, and plugged his cell phone charger in. And so now he could, you know, you could, you could Instagram now again. So now that's not ideal. You don't want to break in your data records. And also you don't want the device to be reset by some idiot. So now what one could do is you could write a note and say, don't touch or, or you know, I, I know where you live. But if you touch this thing, I will come to your house. Or something. You can do those things, but none of those work. But there is something that works. It's, a, it's an old trick in the museum trade. And we did that, I did that with this logger. And the note simply says, do not move this device. If you have touched it, wash your hands immediately and consult a medical practitioner. <laughs> so about a week later, I was, I was at the observatory and Teresa called me over and she said she's, she's got somebody who would like to ask me a question. And there was this young student standing with his hands behind his back, my fault. Um, now, he was a black kid, but he was like white as I was because he was terrified because he was the one who touched the data logger to charge his phone. And now he saw the message. <laughs> so when Ian and I, when Ian and I finished, um, so it was Johan and myself and Ed primarily who were um, looking after these things and then um, um, Ian was around for the last half of, the, of this reclamation project and then we, we put a doom fogger machine in there to, to kill all the nasty and then uh, somewhere I've got a photo of Ian very gleefully writing a similar note on, to stick onto the door of the building that says if you touch this please consult your medical practitioner that's the best way to to keep people from something. Well, okay, thank you very much for um, sharing that uh, with us. And you know, I think we all understand that the bigger picture here is if we don't, you, you know, if it's not for people like you guys that preserve this for us, we're not going to be able to tell this history. You know, the past hour, uh, you know, has been fan has been fan fantastic, and all the information that you've shared with us, you know, is due to the fact that we've been able to recover some of this old inf inf information. Mm -hmm. Right, guys, are there anyone else that's still got a, a question for Oka? Right, thank you so much, then Oka. I would really like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for taking some some of your precious time out to uh, come and do your presentation for us. And uh, we hope to have you back in the future soon for a, another talk on uh, on your whole preservation project. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone for listening. And I'll be asking you all to volunteer for our project. Don't, don't, don't be too happy to, to cheer me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Marius, Marius, yes. if yes, you've sir. got a moment before you close out, um, yes, if you can share, can I just show you the picture of Neowise? I found it while Alka was showing the other comments. It's the one I took this July. Absolutely. Just give me a second. Just sort of uh, share the hosting just for so just one yeah, picture. Not a problem. I'll just... Uh, and it was actually my first ever attempt at astrophotography of any sort. I think I hit lucky. <laughs> Certainly not in the quality of the pictures of Nauka's book, Pearls of the Southern Skies. <laughs> You've got co-host. Right. And I'm not yet. Yeah, give me a second, sorry. I didn't press yes. <laughs> that should be it now. Yep. There he goes. Can you see it? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that's a oh. naked eye that's looking just to the east of north. So that time of year, 13th of July, the sun is only about 20 degrees below the horizon because it gets light by 3, 3.30 in the morning. Um, ISO 3200, so I didn't push it up too high. 
f5.6 73 millimeters so it's not telephoto it's almost a a, a, a naked eye scale view uh 20 second exposure i've tried a number of them it's in the, it's at the western edge of origa uh capella is just off to the upper right just out of view but um that's quite a long tail there very so good um, where were you where am I? Yes. In my back garden in South End, Essex, England. Okay. Well, thank you, Barry, for sharing, for Barry, for sharing that photo with us. That is uh, really that is uh, that is amazing. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, I, it really is a case of I hit lucky, first time <laughs> lucky as a trial out. So <laughs> it was interesting. Okay, sorry to take up your time. No, 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 not, not at all. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's a really wonderful photo. Right, everyone, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, and, and once again, uh, thank you, Barry, for um, sharing that photo with us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Alka. Thank you so much, Alka, for uh, taking the um, time out to uh, uh, come and uh, give your um, talk to us. And... This then formally brings us to the end of tonight's meeting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let the uh, Zoom meeting go on a bit and then we can socialize a bit, but I will uh, be formally uh, ending the, uh, the formal meeting now. Thank you so much, everyone.